Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House for this wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, daylight savings time is in, so uh, it's going to be uh, getting lighter and lighter, later and later. So that's really nice. So today's uh, March the 14th, 2021, and I'm just so glad that you could join us for today's Sunday morning service. Um, I sure miss all of you, uh, miss seeing you in person, but hopefully very soon, prayerfully very soon, we're going to be able to meet in our building again. And uh, until that time comes, I'm just so thankful that we have this ability to, uh, to share the word online. And for all of you from outside of our church family that are tuning into this broadcast this morning, welcome. Well, today I'm going to be uh, bringing a message to you that's dear to my heart, and um, I, I believe it's a very timely message from uh, the Old Testament. And would you uh, bow with me in a word of prayer before we um, begin today? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we can gather together online and that uh, we can hear from you, from your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that as I speak this this message today, that you would speak through me, Lord. I, I know that it's all about you, Jesus, and I pray that you would be exalted and glorified, and that, Lord, you would change hearts and lives as they listen, and you'd help me to explain this in the way that you would have people understand it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So today, within the books of the Old Testament, uh, in the history books, we see um, that there's biographies given of numerous kings. And these stories have been placed by God in his word uh, to be lessons that he wanted future generations to heed. Now, due to the ancient setting and unfamiliar culture, I, I've heard some people question whether or not there's any validity to the application of such stories in today's world. But... Um, in light of this question, I, I believe it's extremely important for us to recognize the importance of the Old Testament and these Old Testament stories. They're meant to be snapshots showing us the law of cause and effect in the decisions that people make. And uh, we see be, uh, examples in Scripture of obedience and disobedience, conformity to the will of God, and rebellion against him. If we carefully ex examine these stories, I, I believe the Holy Spirit will uh, guide us into understanding valuable lessons for practical living in the here and now. Now this morning I'd like to take uh, you to a story that's found in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Now this passage of scripture is all about the history of Israel and it's really about the effects that good leadership and obedience have on individuals and on people collectively. Now, I've entitled my sermon this morning, uh, Lessons of Wisdom from King Asa. So, would you turn with me in your Bibles, if you have your Bible with you, to 2 Chronicles chapter 14, starting to read from verse 1 through to the end of verse 5. And it's written, and Abijah rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Asa, his son, succeeded him as king, and in his days the country was at peace for ten years. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to obey the laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. May God bless the reading of his word. So we look at the condition of God's chosen people before uh, King Asa took the scene. Before he took over the kingdom of Judah, um, we've seen within Israel as a whole a substantial decline. And um, following uh, King Solomon, we saw the fall of the kingdom of Israel from its pomp and glory 
into a divided kingdom. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi occupied the southern portion of the land of Canaan. The name of this kingdom was the kingdom of Judah. Now the kingdom, the kingdom of Judah was of the house and lineage of King David. Now to the north of Judah um, and the other two tribes, the remaining nine tribes of Israel lived in the land that was known as the kingdom of Israel. The northern kings who ruled over this land, they were not from the line of David. So we see that looking into these books of history, that the northern kingdom of Israel had no righteous kings from the time that the Israelites were divided. The northern kingdom's history was blackened and characterized by all-out rebellion against God, which uh, was led by the nation's kings. As a result of this rebellion, uh, both leadership and people in the country, um, the northern kingdom did not receive any blessings from God. It, it appeared actually that this kingdom was under uh, a constant curse. Now, there is the capital city of the northern kingdom in northern Israel today. It's known as Tel Dan at the time of the kings of Israel in the ancient times. It, it was known as the city of Dan. It was in northern Israel. And uh, in that particular city was an altar that was set up to worship a golden calf. You see, after the division of the kingdom of Israel with the north going and setting up their capital in Dan, um, the king that uh, led these, the all-out rebellion of this tribe against God, his name was King Jeroboam. And um, Jeroboam was a deeply insecure man. And he feared that if he permitted the people of the northern kingdom to go to Jerusalem to worship God there, um, that they might turn their allegiance back to the southern kingdom and that he would lose his power as they rejoined him. So what he did was he ended up building an altar and setting up an altar in Dan. And um, instead of worshiping the Lord their God, he uh, told the people of the northern kingdom to worship the gods that brought them out of Egypt. And he set up a golden calf. Even after all the history of what had happened in the wilderness travels, he set up a golden calf in Dan on a pedestal. Now, I was there uh, several years ago and actually walked up to this place and seen it and uh, seen where they had put this golden calf. It's still there today. And um, it's interesting that... Uh, this golden calf altar was facing away from Jerusalem. So the, uh, the altar was in front of the image of the golden calf on a pedestal. And the pedestal, you had to look at the pedestal and was facing completely opposite from the direction of Jerusalem. So this was signifying the complete turning away of the northern kingdom from serving the Lord God Jehovah. Now... The southern kingdom of Judah, however, um, had a better track record. Uh, there were some kings in its history that did what was right in the eyes of God. And as a result, those kings led their people into righteousness and freedom while they reigned. And uh, they enjoyed God's blessings. And we know that the kingdom of Israel was, the, the northern kingdom, was taken into captivity by Assyria. And much later, the kingdom of Judah um, Benjamin and Levi were taken into Babylon as they were under the rulership of wicked kings. But during the time when good kings were ruling, the nation of Judah, the southern nation, received God's blessings. And uh, Asa was one of those righteous kings who ruled over the southern kingdom. As a matter of fact, he was the first of them. And um, Asa endeavored to serve God wholeheartedly. He did not have um, a single good influence from his immediate ancestors. 
As a matter of fact, his father, Abijah, and grandfather, Rehoboam, um, practiced evil in the sight of the Lord, we're told in the scriptures. And Mekah, his grandmother, corrupted the people during parts of the three reigns of his grandfather, his father, and, and himself with her pagan Canaanite worship practices. And a host of powerful influences um, were surrounding King Asa, and they would have been powerfully drawing him towards wickedness and idolatry of his forefathers. Um, yet Asa was the first good king of Judah, and he did what was right in the eyes of God. Now, what did he do? The, the first thing that King Asa did when he took power from his father is King Asa perch, he purged the idolatry from the nation. He went about and routed out idolatry, and he reformed the religion of his people. When Asa took over as king, his father, King Abijah, had been divided in heart. You see, Abijah um, would worship the Baals or promote the worship of the Baals and Ashtaroth, and yet part of the time he would worship the Lord. So he, for First Kings chapter 15, 3 to 4, speaks of Abijah saying, he committed all of the sins of his father had done before, sorry, we'll repeat that. He committed all of the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his forefather had been. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by raising up a son to succeed him and by making Jerusalem strong. So we see that King Asa did not have a divided heart like that of his father. Like Gideon the judge, uh, King Asa began his reign with a sharp attack on the nation's idolatry. And he took actions against the evil that was destroying his people. Now at this time, the subjects in Judah had idol, idol uh, worshipping um, temples and, and high places uh, for the worship of other gods. And, and King Asa recognized the evil consequences of, of the rebellion that they were, they were involved with. And, and he knew that Jehovah was holy and righteous and he was the only true God. So he began to reign by tearing down the idols and destroying the temples and the places in which they were worshipped. Now, ever since the Israelites had come into the land of Canaan, up to, up to this point, the land which Jehovah God had given to them, um, they struggled. They struggled with the sin of worshipping uh, the Canaanite deities that were, that were common in the land before they entered it. Now, it's important for us to understand um, that the entire reason why the, the, the seven nations of Canaanites were routed from the land of the Israelites in the first place was because they were participating in detestable practices of worship of their false gods. The entire, the worship practices of the Canaanites were based around fertility cults, which uh, included very detailed lists of different sexually immoral practices coupled with violent human sacrifices of children. And uh, Leviticus 18 goes through this in a very detailed way, listing the perversions that the Canaanites participated in. And as a, as a result of these practices, from uh, Leviticus 18, 24 to 28, the Lord commanded, Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. So I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my, my decrees and my laws. The native-born and the aliens living among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all of these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it had vomited out the nations that were before you. Strong words. King Asa recognized the reason for the downfall of the kingdom of Israel and the people being double-minded, uh, worshipping Baal and Ashtaroth. That was a detestable thing in God's sight. The people in Israel, in Judah, 
were only giving themselves partly to the worship of Jehovah. Although Asa saw his father Abijah both tolerate and participate in these practices, he wanted nothing to do with these things. He, he wanted to worship the true and living God wholeheartedly. And when he became king, he set aside the ways of his father and he attacked the evil at its root. Verse 3 of our text in 2 Chronicles 14 tells us about his campaign of restoration. It says, He removed the foreign altars in the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. And, and one of the right reasons why Asa did this was because God sent him a word of prophecy from Azariah the prophet, who said to him in 2 Chronicles 15, 2-4, um, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he, and, and he was found by them. You see, Asa put it in his heart to help heal the hurt of his people. His name was well chosen, for the name Asa actually means physician or cure. So Asa's family and the nation under his charge, they had been suffering from the decisions of his father and other members of his family, and the dis and, and the, the detestable decisions they had made to reject Jehovah in favor of these false Canaanite deities. And it's interesting about this passage in Scripture that I just read that with other people that were subject to um, Asa's dominion, we don't see any vigorous resistance to Asa's measures to clean up the land. Uh, when Asa made a choice, the people of Judah in the kingdom, they appeared to be weary of how things were going and are ready for a change. They were weary of the sins of King Abijah. They embraced Asa's leadership away from idolatry and the double-mindedness of the former king. And from their disobedience of King uh, from the disobedience of King Solomon through to his grandson Abijah, idolatrous practices had been tolerated and encouraged. But Asa's acts of reformation, they were a refreshing change. And uh, that I think the people were ready to reject lukewarmness and lukewarmness in their commitment. It was almost as if the people respected the stand that the king uh, had taken against what they inwardly knew was evil. So what was the result of this purging and, and this repentance? Second Chronicles 14 verses 5 and 6 tell us, He removed the high places and incense altars on every, in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. So King Asa set an example for the people of Judah. He didn't worship the idols himself, nor did he tolerate their worship, and he destroyed them, and he routed them out. God blessed Asa's kingdom with peace, because his righteousness uh, was, um, was such that God was well pleased. And, and the first thing he did was reform the religion. Secondly, King Asa built up the kingdom. So he didn't just reform the religion, but he began to rebuild. So he reformed, and then he rebuilt. 2 Chronicles 14, 6-7 says, He built up the fortified cities in Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years. For the Lord gave him rest. Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers and gates and bars. This land is ours because we have sought the Lord, our God. We sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built up and they prospered. When they were building strong, God gave them rest against all of their enemies. Asa's righteous actions and the actions of the people in following his, his example found favor in the Heavenly Father's eyes. And resultingly, he was able to strengthen the position of his kingdom. He was able to spend some time 
free from harassment from the enemy, uh, the enemies around him, building up these cities and fortifying them and, and so that uh, not only did he reform uh, the religion uh, in the land and rid the land of idolatry, but he also built up the strength of the people. So, thirdly, King Asa's kingdom uh, prevailed when it was eventually tested by being attacked. Now, the time came when the rebuilding had been accomplished in accordance with God's desire. And at that time, the Lord permitted Asa and his kingdom to be tested. The people were tested. Uh, during that the time where uh, Asa was enjoying peace, he built a substantial military force. As a matter of fact, verses 8 and 9 say, uh, Asa had uh, an army of 300,000 men from Judah, equipped with large shields and with spears, and 280,000 from Benjamin, armed with small shields and with bows. All of these were bright, or sorry, brave fighting men. After enjoying a time of peace, God saw fit to allow Asa's kingdom to be tested. Verse 9 and 10 tells the story. Zariah, or Zerah, the Cushite, marched against them with a vast army and 300 chariots came out as far as Mashira. Asa went out to meet him, and they took up battle position in the valley of Zephanath near Marisha. Well, in life it's funny how everything can be going so well, and peace can be surrounding us on all sides, and then all of a sudden, without any kind of a warning, things change. An enemy mobilizes against us, and we find ourselves to be at the brink of war. Asa experienced this. Once he was fortified and strong, God permitted an enemy to be mobilized against Judah. Now, facing this army of Cushites, uh, Asa was faced with a decision. Would he be arrogant and overconfident in his own strength? You see, at this time in history, his force of 580,000 well-trained, brave fighting men they would have been a formidable force to be reckoned with and maybe uh, a force that uh, Asa could be tempted to be a little bit cocky about or overconfident about in it. And I believe that God allowed the enemy to test Asa's resolve because um, it doesn't sound like there were that many chariots from the Cushites um, where you know, Asa might just be, oh man, that's no problem. We can just go out there and take those guys. They're not a threat to us. Well, I believe the Lord was testing Asa's resolve. Would he try to fight the battle with his own strength that he perceived? Or without asking God to help him? Would he look around to the kingdom that he had seen rise up around him? And the army under his command and be proud? Or would he humbly recognize that what had been given to him was a gift from God and it came from the fountain of God? What would a king Asa do? Well, verse 11 answers the question. Then Asa called out to the Lord God and he said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord God, for we rely on you. And in your name, we have come against this vast army. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let them prevail against you. Wow. King Asa resisted the temptation to be self-reliant and confident in his own strength, even though he had what appeared to be a great support base, a great army under his command. He, he decided that everything had been granted to him, including the strength of his mighty men that stood before him. By the blessings of God. Asa humbled himself. He chose to bow the knee of his heart and conscience to the Lord. He humbled himself, placing no confidence in his flesh, nor in the strength of the army that stood with him. 
Verse 12 shows the results of his decision to honor the Lord. The scripture says that the enemy was the, the enemy that was attacking was completely and utterly routed. The Lord struck down the Cushites. Notice how it says the Lord struck them down before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far, far as Gahar. Such a great number of Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. See, the Lord completely routed the army. The victory had been won because God was on their side. God's blessing was upon Asa and the children of Judah because of Asa's heart and the people's heart that were not turned towards idols and immoral living. They were turned towards the holy God of Israel in obeying him. Asa didn't allow the blessings of his strength to make him conceited. He acted in humility and understood that he was nothing without God and that God was able and willing to help them when victory over the enemy was achieved. Notice how he gave credit to the Lord his God and acknowledged that it was the Lord's victory. Have we been compromising by completely turning our back on everything that God has given us as a gift? Like the wicked king Jeroboam? Um, you see, in the name of convenience, selfishness, and insecurity, sometimes believers, people claiming to be believers, have rejected the truth and followed a lie. They've turned their back on God and turned to their golden calf idols and abandoned righteousness. Now those northern tribes under the wicked king ignored God's ways, turning from him and gave, him, and gave themselves over to the worship of the cultural deities and also deities of their own making at an altar of convenience, pouring themselves out. If we're in that position where we've poured ourselves out to false gods, we need to repent. Or maybe you're, you're saying, Pastor, I, I'm not quite at that point. I, I think maybe I've got a problem with compromise, but, you know, I kind of like my little bit of sin, right? A little bit of church, a little bit of God, and a little bit of sin where, you know, I got a few hang-ups. Well, who doesn't? You know, well, God's grace is sufficient for me. So, therefore, you know, I can just keep my foot over here and my foot over here and, you know, this is the same thing as what, what Asa's father and grandfather and grandmother were doing. You know, most of what they were doing was wickedness. And once in a while they'd do the token worship of Jehovah. But, you know, six days out of the seven days of the week they were living for themselves and living, serving, uh, you know, what, what would benefit them. And as a matter of fact, the fertility cults were all about, um, you know, giving man the power to, uh, to, to kind of change the deity of their choosing, uh, to change his mind, to bless them and to, to prosper their lives. Well, you know, we don't do the same things, maybe, you know, bowing down to uh, an idol like that, but, you know, um, there's things in our lives that maybe are a type of worship uh, like immorality in Israel or in Judah I should say and Israel or uh, maybe we're sacrificing our children for prosperity you know we're we're chasing the almighty dollar trying to get ahead in life if that's you this morning man you need to stop here and, and like the person who's totally turned their back on, on the Lord's uh, way. You need to take stock and realize that you're on dangerous ground. So maybe that's you this morning. 
Or do we have a steadfast and, and uncompromised dedication to our Lord God, Jehovah, like King Asa? And you see, it's true that sin is deceptive and, you know, it's destructive. And it has a funny way of getting into our lives and hardening us. Um, so that we don't get bothered by it so much as we participate in it more and more. And there's that saying, you know, the problem with a little sin is that it doesn't stay little. The consequences of the history of idolatry with the family of Israel were very bad, right? First of all, we see that the sin of the kingdom resulted in the family being split up, right? And one side of the family went totally away from God, and the other side was only partially devoted to God, and uh, we're lukewarm. Secondly, another product of the sin is that the blessing of God was lifted off of the kingdoms that were rebelling against him and, and pursuing evil. Enemies came and pillaged and plundered at will. The enemy infiltrated the people and brought uh, in with them even more wickedness. What a picture of the world that we're living in today, isn't it? The church is not exempt from such an onslaught. Now, Everywhere we look, families are being crushed, battered, bruised, beaten down. People are being beaten and broken all around us. People that were formerly devoted to the things of God have abandoned holy living and have embraced the world's philosophy of living. And not just in one area, but in so many different areas. Trading in God's best for something that is less. Still going to church, some of them but living a double standard in a false sense of security, much like these children of Israel had abandoned the way of truth and were divided in heart to follow after the Baals and Ashtoreths. Now God wants us to take notice of what happens when we repent of our sins and how the sins of our family can be rejected and how we can come into righteousness by the grace of God. We need, to, we need to look at the life um, that was produced in the, in the southern kingdom under the leadership of King Asa. See, much of what is lost in the present age um, in the lives of apostate people and people that are carnal is the result of compromising choices that have been made. That little sin just doesn't stay little. Maybe it's time for us to evaluate the kingdom of our hearts and to see what God wants us to deal with. So let's ask tough questions. Where is my heart when it comes to finances? Am I sacrificing my children for, for gaining prosperity and money? What about hobbies and entertainment? Am I... Am I taking all my time and, and putting it towards that at the expense of time with family, at time with friends, time uh, uplifting and edifying other people in the church, reaching out to others with the life-changing gospel? Are we allowing immorality into our homes through our television sets or computer screens or tolerating the Canaanite-like filth that fills our greater modern society? These are questions. We have to ask ourselves and be honest with this. People of God, the human heart does not change. It's the same today as it was back then. There's no sin that is uncommon to man. You see, we face exactly the same issues as the people in King Asa's day faced. It's true that we have different cultures and different technologies, but we struggle with the same issues. It's time to do some introspection. If things are not right, there is grace and there is mercy and there is forgiveness. And God desires to cleanse you. He will help you to live a life that is clean. A life that is pure. A life that is holy. Now it's not easy to get rid of sin that we've grown to love. But it is downright impossible to get rid of that sin that we have grown to love without the strength of the Spirit of God. So call out on the Lord. Call out for mercy. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is 
is here right now. The Spirit of God in the believer. We, we're living in the new covenant. The Spirit of God lives within you. You don't have to obey the sin nature anymore. You can throw away that stuff. You can walk away from it. Sin does not have to have this power over you. Because Jesus has come to break the power of sin. And if you call upon the name of the Lord, he will strengthen you and he will cause you to be holy. Even as he is holy, he'll help you. See, Satan is a liar. He always has been and he always will be. He has always had a way of convincing humans that somehow God is holding out on us and holding out on something good. Therefore, he encourages a heart of rebellion. As to say somehow that this rebellion against the word of God will... Uh, will benefit us somehow, but he inwardly knows, Satan knows that uh, he who knows the truth and follows Jesus um, will, will live. And uh, he knows that those who follow the flesh will reap from it destruction. So he's going to try everything he can to try and get you to read to embrace rebellion. King Asa didn't give in to this temptation to hold on to disobedience that his father had done and his grandfather had done and the northern king was doing. He, he would lead his people into tearing down strongholds, secret places in the heart where the kingdom interests had been divided. Would you commit yourself to the Lord today? To tear down the idols? To rid yourself of those things and the things, uh, the spheres of your influence? To take leadership in those areas and, and tear down the things that are not right and get rid of them? Wherever unwholesomeness reigns, that's where we need to do business. God will empower you to do it, but he asks you to take action. Sometimes we sit on our ha haunches and we don't take action. God wants you to take action, not just consider it, take action. If we're leaders, there may be some resistance to the change, but you might be surprised. People might be really weary, just like in the case of this story in scripture, they might be weary of all the idolatry and all the oppression. And it might be a refreshing change to see you rise and take responsibility in the joy and strength of the Lord to, to bring purity to the realm that he's given you leadership in. By his Holy Spirit, he'll give you provisions of overcoming power. It's, a, it's important we understand, though, Jesus is not going to make us give up things, but he wants us to be willingly obedient out of love for him. The Holy Spirit requires our cooperation to tear down these altars. If we tolerate evil like Abijah or the northern kings, we will be consumed and led into captivity along with our families and the people in our sphere of influence. But if like King Asa, we stand up for righteousness, rejecting idolatry and smashing the high places in our lives, partnering with the Holy Spirit, we will be blessed in our lives. God will bring peace into our kingdoms, into our realms in order that we might build them strong and fortify the positions of our lives with the strength that God can give us. The peace of God will rest upon us and our realm as we do this. The process of fortification is, is like reading the word of God and learning the deep truths in times of devotions by, by listening to good music instead of bad music by seeing good things with our eyes instead of bad things with our eyes, by meditating on the word and, and the biblical principles that are there and the applications that are so, so rich. Realize that, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Not greater is me that is in me, but greater is he that is in me. 
You don't have what it takes to overcome the enemy's assaults on your own strength. Realize that now. Bow the knee of your heart like King Asa did before God. Even if it appears that you're well fortified and that God's blessed you and that you've got all this knowledge and you got all this support from other people, you got a great army walking with you, hey, don't be overconfident. Know that it is the Lord that gives victory and ask Him to fight on your behalf. This is the shelter that we find ourselves in. We, we, we hide in the, the shelter of the Lord. And when we fight, we fight with the word of the Lord. It's the sword of the Spirit. See, it's not our sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. And we wield it. But it is God. And it is God's word that overcomes. When the day of evil come, comes, and it will. Let's be like King Asa, who was wise, because his heart was in that right place. The Cushites were no match for God and his army. No army, it doesn't matter how vast it is that comes against you. No circumstance that comes against you that is formed by the enemy to try and destroy you. None of that will prosper if you depend upon the Lord. This is the lesson in this story. If we act like King Asa, our hearts will not be hard and we'll call upon the Lord to fight our battles. And the enemy will be dealt a mighty blow. We will drive them back. The Lord will drive them back, I should say, as we pursue them. And God will give strength to our arms to destroy and neutralize their attack against us to the point where they're going to be unable to mount another serious attack against us for some time. You know, in my closing comments, I, I ask, are we like the righteous kings, like King Asa, in the realm of our lives? Do we hate evil and idolatry, love the Lord our God with the same conviction and, and devotion as King Asa? Are we willing to take a stand to stop evil practices when we see them, that are prevailing everywhere we look, but to keep them away from our home, from our realm? Or do we need a righteous cleansing from God? Do we need to repent from that which is evil? Which left to its own devices will cause us much grief. If we, through God's strength, tear down high places, rid the land of idolatry, God will bring peace to our realm and order us to rebuild and to fortify. You'll be given opportunities to fortify, to build the walls and gates around your cities around the areas of your lives for which you are responsible for. And when it comes time to be tested, we will be ready before the Lord. We will not be arrogant on, and dependent on our own strength, but we will call on God to fight for us and God will grant us victory. You see, as God was with King Asa, so he is with his people today. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Amen.